Man, we're really going to put this video up. This is like take five or take six at this point. We've been trying to record this video and film it for a couple of weeks now. Are you, you really, you really, we're really going to do it. Are you really going to hit upload this time? You're not going to delete it. You're not going to wait. Okay. All right. All right. We'll do it. We'll, we'll do it. I promise. Sometimes you got to keep your producers in check. Uh, what's going on, everybody? You found Bottom Tier Collector, and I am your host, the scraggly one. Yeah. Uh, I need a shave, but uh, I'll take care of that later. Uh, let me need a little haircut, too. Got the hair poking through. <laughs> um, so never mind my the way I appear. Uh, this will be a talking head video, so you can put your phone down. You don't even have to look at me. Um, I want to hit on Star Wars and Obi-Wan Kenobi, not the character specifically, but the show. Um, we just had episode six a day ago within the last 24 hours or so. Excuse me. Today is Wednesday. So 10 and a half hours. Excuse me. Um, I'm on second shift, so my, my hours and my days are out of loop. But um, I've got some concerns watching Obi-Wan Kenobi. And first off, bef before we do anything, hit that pause. Take a deep breath. Okay, did you come back to me? I'm going to give a disclaimer here, a preface. I do understand... George Lucas and his original vision was episode four, five, and six. He filled his continuity gap from episode one, two, three. I believe this could be urban legend. Put it in the description if you know the actual facts. I believe he acknowledged the General Thrawn series by Timothy Zahn as the the sequels to the original trilogy that he accepted as canon um i think that could be more of an urban legend than an actual fact but i would love to see it in the comments if you can verify that information so that is generally the original canon the original vision of george lucas and i understand Either, again, if this is an urban myth or not, I understand either the fans drove him away and he got tired of the negativity and burnout and decided to um, sell his property to Disney. Or he just decided to cash in on Star Wars and just get out and live his life. He didn't want to live his life behind a camera. Uh, coming up with Star Wars content the rest of his life. Because people are complicated. Uh, they're not just black and white things that do one thing or the other all the time. So I understand that. And I understand that George Lucas knew when he sold, is it Lucas Arts or Lucas Films Limited uh, and his Star Wars franchise to... I think it was Disney. Um, I'm not too sure how all this works because Lucas Arts was sold to EA, and then I can't remember. I don't know if e e Disney owns EA. Uh, actually, they don't because I'm on Robinhood, and EA and Disney are separate companies you can invest in. So EA and Disney are separate, but Disney owns like half the world. So I, I forget who owns who in this world of corporate conglomerism. Anyways, politics aside, that is my preface. I understand George Lucas understood uh, Star Wars was going to be changed and added to and made bigger when he sold the property. So, we understand the preface. Let's move that out of the way now. You have a clear understanding of what, what I already understand, what I, what I know, my common sense. And so, I'm watching Obi-Wan Kenobi, and 
I just can't help but think about we are changing the perspective of Star Wars. And it worries me. I'm going to give you the punchline. I'm not, I was going to say this for the end, but I'll give it to you now. It's worrying me, or the thesis statement, I should say, that we are making the original movies obsolete. Um, let's, let's take the book of Boba Fett for instance. Again, pause, take a deep breath. Uh, I'm not here to bash on the book of Boba Fett. I personally love the show. Press play. All right. So, Boba Fett, who is my favorite movie era character? Well, it depends on how I'm feeling. I love Darth Maul. I really do. Darth Maul is pretty cool. I like to root for the bad guys. <laughs> it's just... Who I am, I think it's fun to root for bad guys. I think the mark of great storytelling, the mark of a great villain is that the villain will drive the story. All the hero has to do in a story is save the day. That's all they have to do. Whether you're watching pro wrestling, or you're watching Star Wars, or Lord of the Rings, or a soap opera, or a cartoon on Cartoon Network. A great villain is the engineer of your story. You need a strong protagonist. Antagonist, not protagonist. Let me get my uh, lingo correct. So, Boba Fett, um, that tangent, <laughs> that tangent fried, fried my eggs for a second. Uh, Boba Fett, I think the original intention of Boba Fett in, if you look in Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, he's supposed to be this mysterious, uh, cold-blooded, calculated bounty hunter. Uh, don't know much about him. Not much fleshed out about him. Uh, there, If you watch a bunch of like History of Boba Fett, I think he's in Empire Strikes Back for like two minutes. I, he might be in all of Star Wars for about like five minutes. I don't know the camera time, but he's not a... Big character in terms of camera time, in terms of impact on the story at all in the original Star Wars movie. So, uh, and then we have books that came out about Boba Fett. And I think, I just think observing what little we had of Boba Fett in the original Star Wars trilogy, personally, I think in my own opinion... I think it was the original intention for Boba Fett to be cold-blooded, calculated, very violent, very dangerous. Uh, if you consider all the other bounty hunters that went after Han Solo and Empire Strikes Back, uh, for Boba Fett to be considered the most dangerous of them all speaks volumes about his character. Um, And when you go to Book of Boba Fett, I think I think the the I don't want to say the context. The context is there. They didn't they didn't change continuity. They, they didn't. But I think they altered the perspective of Boba Fett a little bit. Um, Boba Fett's a lot more compassionate a lot more i understand he's aged and he's wiser and, and in today's art of storytelling uh complexity matters a lot we got to make characters dynamic can't have them to be one note you know not everybody can be the terminator or robocop or rambo i understand that but you did change the perception of boba fett whether that's right or wrong you can decide for yourself um but he's he's older, wiser, slower, um, a bit more compassionate. Some uh, uh, an emotion I didn't know he had was compassion, um, and, and he shows that especially at the end where he's going to take care of the citizens of Moss Eisley, and I just don't know if that fits the original intent of the character, the original envision 
uh, the original vision, not envision, or the original perception of Boba Fett. Um, so let's go to Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, the show, not the character. So I'm going to, I'm going to pause here. I'm going to give you guys a second to pause. I'm going to gather my thoughts for a second. Pause. All right. Did you come back? Are you with me? Uh, we're going to talk about Obi-Wan Kenobi. There's going to be spoiler stuff, but I'm not going to go into details. I'm not breaking down Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm just going to give an overarching opinion about it. Um, first off, show was great. Fantastic show. Um, I think I think it was a little slow. I think the plot could have been written differently. I didn't need the plot to be what it was. However, it finished very strong, and uh, I don't I don't think anybody that's a fan of Star Wars is not gonna like the show Obi Wan Kenobi unless you're looking for a reason to tear it down. Uh, is it the best thing to ever come out of Star Wars? No. And I don't even think Disney intended it, intended for it to be. But they did intend to show that they meant business with Obi Wan Kenobi. They meant to take care of it, and and they wanted to show that they wanted to do it right. Um, I will say, I think, I think the show stays in line with the perception we have. Uh, of the characters from the prequels. I, I I really felt like, and even obviously it's Ewan McGregor, but it still felt like Obi-Wan Kenobi after all these years. It didn't feel like he was too far removed from the character that he couldn't come back and portray Obi-Wan Kenobi again. It still felt like... Episode 3, Obi-Wan Kenobi, after all these years, after, after roughly a decade later, um, where, where, so, so the acting was fine, uh, the special effects were fine, the perspective is, is what concerns me, um, you got Darth Vader, especially with Darth Vader, I think Darth Vader specifically, um, Again, it, it's really cool that they're bringing a lot more content, Darth Vader content, to the big screen and the little screen, the television. Uh, I, I think it's what fans want. I, Darth Vader is Star Wars. Like I said, the mark of a good villain is that he drives the story. And Darth Vader is Star Wars. He is the story. Not only is he in the pilot seat driving the story where it needs to go... He is the story. Everybody else is just in Darth Vader's world. Um, or so it may seem. But you've got in episode 3, Darth Vader is um, coming down uh, this, I want to say an alley, or coming down the street. And it didn't look like a main busy street you'd have the, the grand market on in this town. But he's coming down the street, and he's, like, snapping necks. I mean, he's just, like, snap, 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 snap. Right, lift you up, throw you over there, lift you up, throw you over there. Um, you, you, you've got that, and then you've, you've got Darth Vader is so strong with the Force, he doesn't even need a lightsaber to fight Reva. In episode 5, which is a really cool moment. That is a flex. Like, Vader effing flexed <laughs> um, in episode 5. Uh, uh, and I've seen episode 6 of all, of all that he did in Obi-Wan Kenobi. That was the flex to me. Uh, just just controlling the lightsaber with the force that was cool um didn't even need a lightsaber to fight reva so you have that moment too and then you've you've got 
episode six, the finale, which which I knew was fan service. I I think if you are old enough and have studied enough story, or you you've paid enough attention to pacing of a story, to things like payoff and, and high moments and low moments in a movie or, or a comic book, even um, paying attention to what questions have been answered, which questions you have going forward. You knew at the end of episode five, all your questions were tied up in a nice bow. You knew they were going to go all out for the finale and give you, because it could have been a five episode series. Uh, really, you really didn't need episode six, but did you? Did you need episode six? Because it was fan service. It was the finale. I think Obi-Wan Kenobi did need uh, it needed a fan service finale. Um, you got Obi Wan Kenobi slinging rocks at Darth Vader. Uh, I don't think Vader does this with his lightsaber. I think he just puts his hand on the ground and makes the ground cave in. Like flex moments, people. And, and then you got Obi Wan Kenobi brings his saber down and slashes. Uh, Vader's helmet open, and you, you got, and, and it's, it's, um, uh, a metaphorical thing along with a physical thing, a literal thing too, you know, the saber slash was so, the literal thing being the saber slash was so, uh, powerful, cut through Vader's helmet, and you're like, oh my gosh, but the metaphorical thing being, he still, it kind of, to me, it represented he's only half Vader. You know, you only saw half the helmet and you saw half Anakin. And and it was metaphorically representative of the struggle between Anakin and, and Vader. Which I, which I did think was really cool. But here's where it concerns me. So we're so we're done. We're gonna, let's let's push Obi Wan Kenobi out of the way. Um, I I won't talk any more about it, especially if you haven't seen it. Um, I'm sorry if you haven't seen Obi Wan Kenobi yet and you stuck with this video. I did give you a chance to uh, pause and come back later. Um, but yeah, you have all that in Obi Wan Kenobi. You you have the the scene in Rogue One where you know Vader slashing down the rebels and swinging them against the wall. <sighs> And then you get to Star Wars New Hope, the original movie. And this is a this is where I want to take a second here and really get into perception. Um, you have about 50 years of Star Wars that exists in the in, in the universe now. We'll just say the universe. The universe is a real thing. Um, You can have four, even five generations, depending on how soon the people are having children or adopting children. But um, realistically, you have three, three, maybe four generations of Star Wars fans. Uh, my family would be one of them. My mother, you know, if my grandfather was, was still alive, he took my mother to see Star Wars in the late 70s. I know it came out on May 25th. I want to say 1977, but I could be wrong. Put it in the description when star the first... Uh, episode came out and if you saw star wars really early on it was just star wars it wasn't episode four a new hope i don't even maybe they did have the scroller i think that was pretty innovative i think that was one thing star wars became obviously they're famous for that but i think that's that's one thing uh that root that I think captured audiences was the, the scrolling prologue or epilogue or I don't know which one comes before the story, the prologue. Um, I think that was there, but it was just star Wars at the beginning. It was not episode four and before. And then once George Lucas realized the monster he created, good monster, albeit, uh, he decided to turn it into a franchise. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that was the deciding factor was we can make a lot of money from this, but money talks and BS walks, right? So 
but anyways, that that's that's the perception. That's why I'm bringing that up. Uh, a lot of people thought Star Wars was it. There's not a lot of overarching plots that can go, carry over into the next movie. Uh, even though there is overarching plots, obviously. Um, but it was it's kind of it could have it could have been a one and done movie and and that, that would have been it um and so that's that's people's perception for a time but then it gets labeled as episode four and now people's perceptions are changed what's coming in episode five? Oh my gosh um and now we have this whole franchise and i'm of the second wave of star wars fans and, and i consider the second wave of star wars fans people that grew up in the 90s uh, I came in, my introduction to Star Wars was episode four, the special edition re-release in theaters in the 90s. My mother took me, that was my first introduction, so I feel like I have almost as authentic of an experience of being, in, my introduction of Star Wars was almost as authentic as an original, or older Star Wars fan's experience. However, my perspective is different, and I think there's two things that uh, people that love to critique Star Wars and find something negative about Star Wars have going for them. Uh, Greedo shouldn't have shot first. Now, that's my perspective. Uh, I I think when I look at it objectively and I take it, I I take a step back. Um, it, it changes the character of Han Solo. It, it takes him from being a a generous I mean, not a generous, an aggressive fly by the seat of your pants, like scoundrel, smuggler, uh, shoot first, ask questions later kind of guy to a guy that maybe thought twice about shooting first. He hesitated for a second, which shows he wasn't as fly by the seat of your pants, wasn't as brave and bold. It does change the character when you make Greedo shoot first over Han Solo. However, my perspective is different. It doesn't matter that much to me. My first introduction to Star Wars was the special re edition re-releases. And honestly, I prefer them. I've seen the black original. Well, I, th I think even up until the special edition re-releases, re there was tinkering done. Um, things added in, deleted scenes or whatever. Uh, but... I uh, had the original black VHS uh, box set or whatever before the special editions came out on VHS and, and Blu-ray. Uh, and, and so I've seen Han shot first. I've seen Jabba the Hutt before he was a big worm. That's another thing. Jabba the Hutt, the only other thing I would consider is... They need, but it needed tweaking. Uh, if you're going to make Jabba the Hutt a big worm in Return of the Jedi, you need to go back to... A New Hope, and take out the fat guy with the fur jacket. Uh, not as intimidating as a big nasty slug worm that has a weird sick fetish for slave girls. Um, so yeah, the, the perspective is different. My perspective. I enjoy all these the additions to Star Wars than the original uh, cut. Now, my son's perspective is different than mine. I'm not so much a fan of Baby Groot and Luke Skywalker being in Mandalorian. I'm ready to kind of move on past the Skywalkers, and I know the Skywalker family is Star Wars. And maybe that worries a lot of fans that, you know, where Star Wars is going to be without the, the Skywalkers. But I think, I think Star Wars has plenty of room to grow, and, and I'm ready to move past beyond all that. Um... However, my son likes Luke Skywalker, and baby, he's all about Baby Groot. He loves Baby Groot. He's got Baby Groot pajamas, slippers. Uh, he's got Baby Groot shirts. Um, I think he's got some Baby Groot toys, even. So, that's his perspective. Now, he's four years old, and and I tried to show him the original movies. And, and I've seen, I've, I've read about stories online from people that that introduced their kids at a very young age the original star wars movies and the kids loved them well i tried I, i'm not sure i tried the original movies i think i said that a second ago i'm a little fuzzy on that 
but I can say I tried episode one. I did try episode one with my with my kid. I think he was three years old at the time. I thought little Annie and the pod racing would would entice him. Maybe maybe he would gravitate to Jar Jar Binks. It it didn't it didn't happen. It, Mandalorian is more about what what he cares about. When he sees Mandalorian and Baby Groot, he says Star Wars. You're watching Star Wars. He didn't say that when I'm watching episode one or Obi-Wan Kenobi. So his perspective is different. His definition of Star Wars is different than mine. My definition of Star Wars is different than somebody else's definition of the original stuff. Now let's bring in comic books. So we're going to put Star Wars on pause. Comic books. I think I have a unique parallel here. This is something I see in comic books. Because nostalgia is a very powerful thing. You have roughly 100 years of comic books, action comics. One was created in the 1930s. And I'm looking at you, X-11 Bravo. We have characters like The Shadow, uh, I think The Phantom, or The Question, or The or the Spirit, maybe. Oh, I get some of these characters mixed up. We do have masked crime fighters prior to action comics, number one. Whether they are superheroes or not, you're going to have to confer to X-11 Bravo. Uh, he he will make that final decision for you, not me. Um, so yeah, we have roughly 100 years of, of mainstream comic books, crime-fighting heroes. And you have many generations of comic book fans. Not only do you have generational fans you also have fans that didn't maybe start when they were a child you have fans like me i started when i was roughly 22 23 years old in the winter of 2013 and um my perspective is different than an older fan you know a lot of older fans consider crisis on infinite earth one of the greatest stories ever and i've it's taken me over a year i'm trying now i am trying to read crisis on infinite earth in its entirety every single tie-in and i get the context i i appreciate the fact that i decided to do it that way i understand all the red skies jokes that older fans tease about with Inf crisis on the infinite earth but it is a struggle for me to get through i don't think this story is the greatest story of all time as a lot of older dc fans would make it out to be um and that comes down a lot of that is nostalgia it really is a lot of people tend to think the era they came up in uh, is the best era. I'm I'm really nostalgic for the 90s. Uh, I'm rebuilding my video game collection and I'm really going after things I grew up on. The Super Nintendo, the Nintendo 64, and the Dreamcast were really big when I was a child in the 90s. And, and those are the three uh, consoles I'm concentrating on right now and, and reacquiring my video game collection that I stupidly gave away all those years ago when I was still a kid. Um... And so, yeah, I, I consider that maybe not the best era of video games, but I have a big spot in my heart for them. those three consoles and their video game um, library. Uh, but anyways, comic books. Uh, I came in to the New 52 and Marvel Now. Uh, right near the beginning of Marvel Now and New 52, might I add... Um, and I don't have a problem, uh, n not so much Marvel now, I'm not the greatest Marvel fan. Anyways, already been discussed, won't cover it. But I consider New 52 a really good, fun uh, universe. I really appreciated the linear storytelling. I liked how everything was interconnected. Uh, I hate that it got busted up largely in part to editorial interference and, and editors acting like Nazis. Maybe that's what it takes to have a linear universe and to continuity check everybody. But I wish it would have been a little more fun for the creators. Um, older fans with a different perspective that grew up in a different time that believe their time uh, is their their era of comic books is better. Which is fine. It's not a wrong point of view. Um, 
they probably crap on New 52. The, the, they, they rewrote all this continuity that we've had decades of history with, and they made everybody young and sexy, and, and I don't feel like I uh, relate to that. I feel disenfranchised. I get that from the older collector. Perspective is different. All right. Yeah, have we got the point? <coughs> People have different perspectives for different reasons. Be it the time they were born, the age they are, etc., etc., etc. All right, let's move into Star Wars. Back to the point, Star Wars. So perspectives are different, right? Beat that horse for the last time, and we will continue on with the examples and the opinion I have. So considering everything that's been made and now we go back we're going to retrospectively look at episode four and does it hold up i don't think so i know it's a cardinal sin these movies are my sick movies when i'm sick for the day uh that that might be a movie because when i'm sick i don't want to watch a new movie i, I feel like crap i don't want to have to pay attention to the plot I want to put in something that's easy that I've seen a hundred times. I know it's going to be great. I don't. I don't have to be put in a bad mood. You know, I if I want to quote something or or have commentary about it in my head or out loud to myself, you know, I can do that with these Star Wars movies because um, I've seen them so much and I, and I love them and I cherish them. <laughs> but I don't. It's, let's especially. You know, if you especially look at the saber fight uh, between Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi, I think we've changed the perspective. I think the intent of Episode 4 was supposed to be years later. Now, I do, I, I do think Lucas probably had... Uh, the main idea of what he wanted from the prequels in mind. Because he sets up the Clone Wars with that message from Leia. You got Mysterious Old Ben. And I think George kind of understand, kind of already knew how Ben got there. Uh, if he didn't at first, at day one, I think I think he thought it out way before he made episode one. Um... So, so I think I think a lot of a lot of what they've done more recently hasn't changed the perspective, the vision, or the intent. But I do think we've changed the perspective, especially on Darth Vader. Um, yeah, you got Darth Vader like holding this guy up, force choking him, showing how strong Vader is. Uh, not he's not force choking him; he's choking him literally with his hands. And then you've got him. Force choking that that general from on the Death Star, but in Episode Four, like I don't feel like Grand Moff Tarkin, even in Rogue One, is going to tell Obi Wan Kenobi the show Vader and Rogue One Vader to stand down. Vader, that's enough. Release him. That never happens in the Obi Wan version of the character or Rogue One. I'm sorry, it doesn't happen. I don't care how in line with the Emperor Moff Tarkin might be. Um, it is my opinion that the Emperor sent Vader to the Death Star to keep Moff Tarkin in line with the Emperor. If you ask me, uh, myself. Uh, so, I just worry, and, 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 and then you look at the, the saber fight between Obi-Wan and, and Darth Vader in episode four. There's a there's a point, and I've I've paused it and I've shown people there's a point that and I know it's the 70s. I know it's the 70s, and I know the special and I, I know technology is so much better these days. But there's a point where uh Obi-Wan is is got his saber up and, and the camera is such a way that the, the glow, whatever they're using to hide the coils that make the saber uh is is you can see it on camera and I paused it even on special editions. I've seen it. And I've shown people. And you can see the coil uh in 
uh, uh, McGinnis, Alec McGinnis's uh, lightsaber. Uh, and then, then the fight was such, it was so cringe, so cringe. It was, it's supposed to be two old men fighting after all these years at the end. Literally one of them is at the end of their life. And I, and I get that. But I don't think it matches up with Obi-Wan Kenobi. I don't understand how you go from episode three and that fight to Obi-Wan Kenobi just 10 years later, to Alec McGinnis and Darth Vader in episode 4 in, in just a 20-year span. Now, if you're talking... <clears throat> now, if, if you're observing the lifespan of someone going from age 60 to age 80, I think that kind of physical deterioration can happen, or somebody from age 70 to age 90. I believe that kind of physical deterioration can happen, especially with someone who's ex who became as stagnant and an old hermit as old Ben eventually became. Uh, however, in Obi-Wan Kenobi, we're not led to believe that he just sat there on his butt. We're, we're led to believe he's still kind of trained in the arts and still can, uh, and, and then at the end, I don't, I don't want to spoil Obi-Wan Kenobi, but we are led to believe he uh, still practiced the Jedi arts. I will just say that much. Uh, he wasn't just an old, stagnant old man that became decrepit and immobile. Um, and, and I understand you're filling continuity gaps, and I understand you're not going to get everything perfect. I understand we are looking at this with a microscope, you know. Looking at every little, you know, period at the end of a sentence here, but really the, the, and I'll try to close here. I know I'm close to 40 minutes. I really, my main concern is I'm worried we are changing the perspective so much and the content that we're coming out with is so good and it needs to be good. It is not a bad thing. For Disney to be making good content. I, I'm thoroughly... I cannot wait for Mandalorian Season 3. I hope there's no more Skywalker stuff in it. Although I suspect there will be. Um, but I worry... We're going to end up like Star Trek. And have the Star Trek problem where... Future generations will not have... An appreciation for the original movies. Like the original fans had like the second and third wave fans still hold at, you know, up to. Um, and, and that bothers me because I don't know where Star Wars is going to be when we hit a point where the original movies don't matter because that is that is a lot of what Star Wars is built upon is these movies matter. These movies are some of the greatest movies of all time. Um I think Star Trek is different. I think Star Trek is written in a different way. Although I do observe Star Trek fandom. And there's a lot of fans that don't care about the original Star Trek. Does it matter? I don't think it does. I think Star Trek is, is a little bit of a different animal. The way the way it works. The dynamics of Star Trek. The dynamics of Star Wars are a little different. The original movies need to matter. That con continuity needs to matter. Um, maybe not... Every single minute detail, uh, I, I think getting into the minutia is is silly, but I don't I don't think observing the evolution of Darth Vader uh, is such a terrible thing, and, you know. And you could argue bef before I end, I'm I'm drawing to an end. I promise. You could you could argue in episode four that the technology wasn't that good, or maybe Darth Vader. Hadn't developed his powers. Well before Rogue One and Obi-Wan Kenobi. I would have given you that. <clears throat> but you have before and after. You have moments before and after episode 4. Where Darth Vader is a hard ass. He literally force wins Luke Skywalker almost to his death. Um, he doesn't even need to hold up his hand to do it. And you know. And, and he also holds his hand up in a blast shot goes right there gets absorbed or, or whatever vader does 
And then you've got all the scenes, again, in Obi-Wan Kenobi and, and Rogue One that don't need to be re-examined. Um, I don't know. I don't know where Star Wars is headed. Well, I do know where it's headed. It's headed for bigger and grander things. I just don't want Star Wars to be rewritten. I really don't. And sometimes it feels like we're rewriting Star Wars. Um, there are things that happened in Obi-Wan Kenobi that changed the perspective. I, I think in Episode 4, we're meant to believe the confrontation between Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader happens after decades. Literally decades. Uh, I, I think it was designed where they weren't. I really think that was the continuity. Obi-Wan Kenobi goes into hiding, and then nothing until episode 4. I really do think that was the original intention, the original perspective for Star Wars. And filling in the gaps, while it's really cool, while it keeps Star Wars alive and fresh and new, uh, it could be making the original movies obsolete. Um... We will just have to wait and see and let the fandom decide if we are making the movies obsolete or not. Um, I love all Star Wars. Uh, I'm a big fan. I've read, I've read some of the books, played video games, comic books. Um, it, it's meant a lot to me in my childhood. And, and uh, I'm looking forward to everything Star Wars going forward. And until next time, guys, as always, thank you for liking, subscribing, commenting on my content. Any support you give me in my channel is much appreciated. And beating that dead horse again until next time.